Thank you. Well, it really is the graveyard shift, and I hope I'm not talking about the graveyard of mitral valve surgery as we know it, but could well be. We live in a time of very great change, and the last year with uh, Brexit being trumped by the USA election shows you what's going on, and I think this is a time of massive change for mitral valve surgery. You've heard the variety of uh, um, devices that are out there. So what I want to do is just remind us of what we have achieved, what we can do, and think about what questions we should be asking uh, in terms of this. Mitral valve surgery, of course, uh, is valve insertion with complete or partial subvalve preservation, and then the repair reconstruction uh, platform, which we've heard such a lot about. And we know that in the right hands, the surgical repair yields excellent and durable results, or do we? Patient selection and timing are very important and are now extremely uh, well discussed, and there are studies to support earlier and earlier intervention. And the role of centers of excellence has been well um, established now for a while. But one of the problems we have is long-term follow-up and the universal application of that. And you have to remember that if you add up all the papers and all the patients ever uh, done in the literature, it is but a small proportion of all the mitral valve surgery that's done. And it reminds me of a, a wonderful quote from a book on art where they say, there's no such thing as art, there are only artists. And there's no such thing as mitral valve surgery, there are only mitral valve surgeons. And everyone achieves a different level of competence and has different levels of experience. And that impacts on the patient outcome. And that's something that we never hear discussed. It's the elephant in the room. The lesions associated with mitral valve disease, you know, we can easily deal with them uh, at the time of open surgery or minimal access surgery. Uh, well, not all minimal access surgery, I have to say. There are a number of series that do not uh, do tricuspid valves with the mitrals. Atrial fibrillation to be dealt with, excision of the left atrial appendage, coronary artery bypass surgery, aortic valve disease. And through the open technique, you can do any of these in any combination with a good outcome. So what is conventional mitral valve surgery? Well, it is the complete surgical correction of all mitral valve lesions, the correction of all associated and additional lesions at the same time. In other words, complete surgical resection. And that is something we need to lay down as a standard because the so-called dental approach, which we heard for coronary disease, is beginning to be applied for valvular disease. We'll do a bit now, we'll do a bit later, we'll do a bit later on, and then we'll deal with the recurrences. And there are cost implications for that. So catheter techniques, I mean, uh, I can't uh, match um, the talk you've just heard from you. It's covered all the techniques extremely well. But what we need to think about is patient selection. What about age? Who do we do it on? There has been a tendency with all of these new catheter technologies to go for the old sick patient. But is that actually right? Should we be thinking about intervening before there's left ventricular change, or should we just restrict it to salvage in the elderly? What about the frailty of the patient? How will they respond? The type of lesion with its functional bileaflet, caudal rupture, et cetera, et cetera. What are the success rates of this? What's the durability? Incredibly important. I'm going to say more about that in a moment and the management of associated lesions, uh, and so on. So what can transcatheter techniques achieve? Well, you can address practically all the problems I've outlined. We can restore competence to the mitral clip with the, the, the new cords and so forth. We can overcome mitral stenosis with balloon dilatation, uh, and early valve insertion, uh, valve in valve technology. You've seen quite a lot about that. Atrial ablation and coronary angioplasty and stenting is all there. But how feasible is it in one go? And if you remember the talk by Lars earlier on and the cost implications of this, it is huge. And if you add all these techniques up, especially in the United States, which has the best cost analysis of any country, I think, in the world, you're talking about 80,000 plus 60,000 plus 50,000 plus 100,000 followed by death. Whereas one surgical operation, you can do it all for about 25,000 in this country, but the NHS is very cheap. So outcome measures. Surgery is the gold standard for most patients, but we have a bit of a problem. It's not as good as we think. There's lots of retrospective data, but there's not much prospective data. And you've already heard this referred to already. And we suffered from this with coronary bypass surgery. It took us 10 years to get the ball back. And there's even less randomized prospective level one evidence. Hence, most guidelines rarely present evidence beyond level two or three. And the cardiologists love this. And when you go to the cardiology meetings, that is what they tell you. Show us your data. And we go, well, we know it works. Not good enough. So does it matter? Well, it does matter. And if we're to head off a whole swell switch to transcatheter technology as the gatekeeper, the interventional cardiologist becomes the salesman. They always have been, they always will be, and they won't be knocking on your door. They'll be doing it themselves. So 
Uh, does it ring any bells? Well, yes, it does. I've said to you in the late 90s, we thought we sat around glumly in this meetings and others thinking we were losing coronary surgery, didn't we? We downgraded the number of trainees we had by 30%, was it, Neil? A huge amount. And there was this terrible despair in the room. But then people like David Taggart and others, bless them, started to put the data together and show it wasn't quite as good as they thought, and coronary surgery was. And now we're back with an equal platform. So don't let these bells uh, not work for you. So what do we and the patient need to know? Well, we need to know primary outcome measures. We need to know mid- and long-term function for either technological platform. It is no good telling us that these devices are working well at six months. It is no good telling us these devices are working well at one or two years. We need five and ten year data. And this is where we should be challenging the cardiologists. What about the recurrence rate of the primary lesion? The rate and timing and nature of any reintervention and the occurrence and frequency of additional lesions. Other outcomes we need as well. Mortality is easy. We can all do that. We have our M&M &M meetings all the time. Cardiologists don't so much, but we do. Morbidity is not so easy. And again, they like to trap us on this. Saw the pa your patient uh, in the clinic four weeks ago, Mr. Moat. I'm sorry, it wasn't very well, you know. Oh, but I'm seeing him six weeks' time, and it'll all be better by then, and it usually is. The length of stay, well, we need to know that, and cost and the speed of recovery. All of this data we are beginning to gather. In our institution, we're looking at various morbidity studies now. And although it's not easy, it is doable, and it's beginning to produce meaningful data. So what do we know? In repair versus replacement, here's some data that we've got in long term, out to 20 years. The numbers get a bit small out there, but we do know what we're doing by 10 to 15 years. We also know in uh, the, the change over time from the 1980s to the 1990s, we've got better, primarily, anti-leaflet prolapse because of the use of neocortex cords. And we know the difference between anti-leaflet and posterior leaflet prolapse, and this will be applicable to the percutaneous techniques as well. And we know the survivorship of repair versus replacement over time. But don't forget, this is again where we fell down with the ischemics. We thought we knew. We thought repair was uh, much more superior to, to um, replacement. And then here's another set of data. Um, this is from the um, uh, circulation paper showing this uh, re residual, the effect of residual MR on no residual MR. And we need to remind the cardiologists of this. It has an impact on the patient's survivorship. And then there was um, Tyrone David's paper, single surgeon uh, data of a long period of time, showing how dependable these results are and the difference between the state of the ventricle at time of referral. And one of the things I don't want to say too loudly outside of this room, that these transcatheter techniques are probably going to do best in early presentation before there's left ventricular dilatation. Do not tell your cardiologist that. Let them find out for themselves. But it's almost certainly going to be true because the long-term impact, mortality and morbidity after mitral valve reconstruction depends upon ventricular function, and we know that. I don't think they know that yet. So um, this is just to show you, this is, I'm, I'm going to refer to the, 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 the study you've heard, the New England Journal of Medicine study about ischemic disease, just briefly, not to make any points or score any points, but years ago it seemed to me, and this was at a meeting that I was uh, debating um, Robert Dion and others about this, what possible difference can a ventricle know between a rigid mitral valve, annuloplasty ring, with, uh, and, a, and a, a mitral valve replacement with complete subvalve preservation? The answer is none. So all we're seeing in the difference in results between replacement and repair is the timing of the surgery and the state of the ventricle in which it's on, and that still isn't reflected in all of the data. And as you've heard today, in ischemic mitral valve disease, it is not one disease. And one of the questions I wanted to ask earlier on, it is all very well placing uh, rings around the cords and, and the papillary muscle, but it must be difference between global dilatation in the truly um, uh, cardiomyopathics and the ischemics where you have a localized area. So you cannot take one solution fits all, and you've heard this beautifully described to you this afternoon by other players. They've got to be tailored to the condition, which is why MRI study you heard uh, spoken about earlier is so important in the ischemic group. And uh, you know this from Michael Mack, who pointed out that uh, in this group of patients, mitral valve uh, repair and replacement were similar in terms of outcome at one year, but the patients who had replacement did better in the, three, the two to three years because of the lack of recurrence of MR. So this demonstrates the importance of high-grade evidence. 
which sadly we don't have. But it also demonstrates the need to standardize our own surgical approach and gain prospective surgical data. So for the younger members of the, the audience here, those who are embarking on your career, the best piece of advice I can give you today is collect your data as you go along and preferably pool it with others. If you get your own prospective data, it is much more meaningful. Um, now, you know this data. This is the, the study for, for the uh, uh, MitraClip. Um, but sorry, I just wanted to show you this. If you want to know what kind of data to collect, this paper is a very good one at describing what you need to collect for your valve surgery. So the um, percutaneous techniques, you've heard, I'm not going to rehearse it again, beautiful description of all the various types that are out there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. I just want to use the MitraClip data how to make, to ram home some of the points that I've been making uh, <clears throat> again further on. This is the, the device we're talking about. And when you look at the residual mitral regurgitation in this study, in the mitral clip group, there was a significant amount of residual mitral regurgitation. And we know from the surgical paper that these will progress with time, a lot of them. A lot of these went on to have surgery. And uh, surgery was quite possible in several of these patients, and they did well. My question is, why didn't they have surgery in the first place? Um, but if you look at the uh, event-free survival, for these patients, you can see that, uh, death, that uh, repeat surgery was necessary in a large group. So I just want to go back. But the timing for this, those that went for surgery after the mitral clip, we're only talking about 36 months. This is nothing. If you're reoperating at 36 months in the majority or a large number of your mitral valve surgery practice, you probably should go off and become uh, some other kind of plumber. So the two most important open questions are long-term durability and the procedure uh, and patient selection. And we can't talk about that now, but we do need to think about it in, in, in detail uh, in this group of patients. And if we look at the, the outcome of the MitraClip data, you know all of this. There was a significant mortality, but of course the, the patients were slightly different than we uh, select for routine mitral valve repair. And since patients with moderate 2-plus mitral regurgitation had a worse outcome compared to patients with none, uh, the definition of procedural success may need to be reevaluated. And you look at here, New York, New York Health Association classification at two years, uh, significant return um, or death of, of later stage um, disease. And if we look at uh, survivorship, which is what we saw in the surgical group, group uh, with the residual mitral regurgitation, much worse if you leave mitral regurgitation. So, and we also know from the um, Alfieri data that if we don't put a ring in with the mitral clip, then we can expect problems later on. Now, why should this be any different in the medical group? It, it, it can't be any different. We know this. So exactly as Neil was proposing, to use an annuloplasty ring at the same time as you're doing MitraClip or you're doing uh, the caudal approach is almost certainly going to develop. They will, it will come and it will move on from there. So I just want to finally wrap up because I've tried to rush through this because you're all desperate to go off for a drink, I know. So what do we need to know? We know who should be offered percutaneous techniques, young or old. And I've just put it to you, those of you in the audience moving into this, do think about the early intervention in the young group because you may get the most stable long-term results because if what we believe to be true is true, and that is as the left ventricular uh, dilatation occurs uh, with late intervention of mitral regurgitation results are worse, why should it be any different in the medical group? And if you start off with a good functioning ventricle, you'll probably end up with one. When should you intervene? Well, again, probably early rather than late. What are the real mid-term, long-term outcomes? We need just device uh, success and morbidity mortality. And what operation, options are there in the failed procedures? And most important, the cost. So don't forget the lessons of history. Interventional cardiologists are unstoppable by anything other than powerful evidence and physician patient education. And here I'd emphasize patient uh, education. I've mentioned the Cori angioplasty problem. And don't forget, an angioplasty or a mitral clip a day keeps your cardiologist healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you.